Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Hello. Are we here? Have we survived one more day? The last day. <laughs> we're here. We are here. There you go. <laughs> Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Dixie, instructional technologist from Western Washington University, in case you didn't, haven't met him. He says of himself that he spent most of his life working with technology as a designer, photographer, developer, and creative director of his own design development firm. He has spent the last decade as an educator, instructional technologist, focusing and creating learning environments that allow people the greatest opportunity to succeed. He has a BA in theater, and he says that he did that because it allows him to be more interesting than boring sub subject matter. And he has an, a, a master's in education, environmental education, so he can speak with conviction to people that think he doesn't know anything. He believes that education is a single, the single greatest tool for improving any system, and will return dividends far in excess of the cost. There's nothing better than the look in students' eye when they suddenly understand something that was baffling them moments before. Uh, he shares a house with his wife of 30 years and a son who wants to be the world's first physicist, actor, adventurer, and vamp vampire slayer. That's the new there one. There we go. That's the newest one. <laughs> so here's Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> It's funny, when I got up this morning, I thought, oh, yeah, I'm in the little room upstairs. And then I looked through, and I, holy crap, I'm not. I'm in the big room at 8.30. Um, so what I'm talking about today is I titled it sort of portable workflow. Might not be quite what you're thinking, but let's go through this. So what is technology? Um, it's a question that I think we need to ask ourselves. Because most of us, you think we would know what it is, because we talk about technology all the time. The problem is I don't think it is, I don't think we understand what it really means when we t talk about it or how that impacts the way we relate to it or how we learn it or how we teach it. So my favorite definition of technology it comes from the Oxford English Dictionary. It's the use of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. Key word here is practical. So the definition of practical is being concerned with the actual doing of something as opposed to just ideas or theories. It's the stuff of just everyday life. You know, making dinner, writing your novel, you know, going to work. This is technology. Now, technology is sort of a catch-all phrase. It can mean anything from the wheel to the shiny new device on your lap. Typically, technology has meant things like fire, the stick, you know, Printing press, a steam engine, get a little closer to home, a stove, a frying pan, your toothbrush. It's all technology. Now, we have an interesting way of dealing with technology. But first, I want to reiterate something. They're just tools. And we need to think about technology in that way, and we don't. So now, if you think of the way our stories deal with technology, right? Just think of all the stories that get written about them. And you probably can put this together. But we create the machines in some sort of act of divine inspiration. Okay? We think of them as, ooh, these perfect children. And we love them. Oh, and then soon we kind of resent them. And then we try to control them. And then they kill us. Now think about it in our stories. Whenever a computer achieves sentience, what's the first thing it does? It tries to get rid of us. It's like number one thing. Ooh, it can think, you're out of here. All right? We have a very complicated relationship with technology. And I think it extends out into the way we look at it versus the rest of the tools in our lives. So how many people learn to drive in driver's ed? OK. What kind of car did you learn to drive on? Ford. Ford. What else? Chevy. Chevy. Yeah, I learned on a 76 Dodge Aspen. Actually, it had wood on the side. It's called it a woody. Some of my students learn in the Hondas and Toyotas. So when we learn to drive, we learn to drive, correct? We don't learn to car or to Ford. Yet when we teach technology classes, how many of our how many people have uh, technology classes that are taught in the universities that they work for? Everybody, right? Oh, let me guess. You teach classes in Word, right? 
or Excel or Photoshop, am I correct? That's like teaching a class in stove, you know, or spoon, or drill, or hammer. We have a completely lopsided way of looking at these tools, right? Remember, they are just tools. And to that end, the only important thing about them is what we make with them, yet we have created this sort of other world around these tools. For instance, how many of you here do tech support? Okay, so you'll get the tech support call and somebody's using Internet Explorer right, on PC. And they're like, oh, this doesn't work. And maybe the first thing out of your mouth is what? What's that? Okay, well, there's that. Or they're, using, or they're using Chrome or Firefox. Yeah, so the first thing out of your, out of your mouth is probably, have you tried, well, after, have you turned it on and turned it back off? Um, but is usually, have you tried another browser? Okay? And you'll see the fear in people's eyes. Oh, it, it, you have another browser? Let's try Chrome. Oh my God, I learned on Explorer, I learned on Firefox. There's this, this idea that they can't get past it. Yet, um, who here owns a hammer? Right? Do you even know what brand of hammer you have? No, yeah. But if somebody hands you a hammer, you don't go, oh my God, this is a craftsman and I'm using a Stanley. I don't know what to do with this thing. Or you get in your car and it's a Honda and you drive a Toyota. Or like when you rent a car, you don't go, oh, what do I do now? Because the logo's different. You know, the worst car I ever drove was a 70, 1976 Saab. And I remember it had, it had the key down here in the, um, on the console. And it took me about 15 minutes to find the damn key. It was like, where's the key? Is there a button to turn on? Other than that, I was able to drive it. Even if you go to England, right, where the driver's side is on the opposite side of what you're used to, the wheel still works, the doors open and close, the brakes work, accelerator works. Essentially, it's a car, it functions the same way. It doesn't blow up on you, it doesn't fly. Yet, we don't have that kind of relationship with technology. So what the heck do I mean by portable workflow? Okay. Let's start with something we all recognize. That is my bag. This one right here. Okay. Now I don't carry a lot of stuff typically. This is me at a conference, so I've got a camera, I've got a USB drive, stylus, headphones, uh, my iPad, my phone was using to take the picture, and then I got a spare battery and a spare card. What's that? Oh yeah, actually, the, it does look like a bow tie. Yeah, my stylus is in there. It's my, my fancy little Japanese silk case, All right? Now I would wager everybody here has at least that much stuff, maybe more. I've seen plenty of people walk around with backpacks worth of stuff. And I bet you you can think of many people you know who carry technology who have got a backpack with a laptop and a power supply and a laser pistol and whatever else they fit in their darn bag, all right? So we burden ourselves down with this stuff. The portable workflow I'm referring to is you. You're the portable part, right? This is not about what new tool can I get to work on my phone or to work on my iPad. It's not about that. It's about freeing you up from what you're trying to do. So early technology. And what's so sad about this, this is from 1954, is I know a lot of workstations where I work that look similar to that. Well, maybe the monitor's newer and it's not a big round cylinder. But there's this idea that we're connected to our desks, all right? If you think about it, think of all the people who are connected to their desks, their keyboard, they don't even get up during the day. I spent, uh, when, talking when she introduced me, I was a designer. I used to work for an ad firm, then I went out on my own. I used to work 18, 20 hour days at my desk. I was 50 pounds heavier, okay? And I never left it. I ate there, I mean, you can imagine, just forward this out a few years, you can imagine it being surrounded by, I don't know, Jolt Cola or coffee cups or whatever else goes around the desk. You gotta remember, the only real value a tool has is what you make with it. So the process of portable, making it portable, making you portable is to understand this. The other thing is you gotta learn to carry less crap around. We all carry way too much stuff and there's a reason for this. Now, I told a friend of mine this, who is a technologist at where I work, his first reaction was literally, are you crazy, why would I do that? You know, it's like he's in love with all these devices. I mean, I swear to God, I think he dates them, okay? You do it, but you don't need to, because it's a crutch. None of you need to carry all this stuff around. You don't. The other thing is it can kill you. And I speak from experience. I had cancer 10 years ago. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I eat properly. I exercised, I had a gym membership. 
But I sat on my ass every day in front of a computer, and I was sedentary. Right? And I can tell you one thing, cancer is a hell of a lot more expensive than you think it's going to be. Right? The impact of it is tremendous. Right? I went from owning my own company to owning nothing, just because my insurance didn't cover all the stuff I needed to go through. It was a long, painful experience. And I'm like a, a reformed smoker or an alcoholic who's going to be on the bandwagon and say, no, 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 you don't need to do this. And the reason that I'm so on this is that as technologists, more than any other group of people, we have the ability to work completely independent of being chained to our desk. I mean, think about it. I work as an instructional technologist at Western. I provide top-level tech support for the, entire, for the entire campus. There's three of us, right? me and two students. I can do my entire job, yeah, maybe 95% of it. I could be sitting in Starbucks and do it. I could do it from home. If I planned it right, I could walk around downtown all day with an iPad and just like stop at various hotspots and do my job. I don't need to be behind desk at all, except for the very small times when I get to meet with somebody or maybe I get to teach a class, but I really don't need to be sitting there. And the funny thing is, none of you do either. At least in some way, you could unchain yourself, get away from it. How do you unchain yourself from a technical life like this? I love technology, I use it all the time, but I use it because it has taught me that I don't have to be sitting behind a desk all the time. It was the worst thing about being in an advertising agency too, I was always there. Now I have the freedom to go hang out with my kids. I actually got to go see my kids play at school. And I answered a question on my phone while I was at it. And I didn't miss anything. I was like, oh, yeah, got it. That's what this promise of this is. So how do you unchain yourself? Well, luckily, there are a lot of ways we can do it. There's a lot of stuff out there that allow us to do it. OK? Unchaining is not as difficult as it seems, but there are a few things you need to think about. One, we live and die by passwords. How many here have hundreds of passwords they have to deal with? Yeah, uh, we all do, all right? And this is the first thing I had to solve. It's like, oh my God, you know, how am I going to use any of these tools, all these passwords? You've got to learn to manage your passwords. And I'm going to show you. I've got a couple things I'm gonna put, I'm, I'll show. You, have to have, you also have to be able to access it from any device, any platform, anywhere you are. That means giving up a little bit of the brand loyalty to one thing or another. My ideal version of a technologist is someone who could walk around without a bit of technology on them anywhere, nowhere in their body, not even carry anything. It's like be able to move around like, I don't know, like a spy or something, and just walk into places and like, oh, I'll use your computer. Oh, let, me, let me see your phone for two minutes and just be able to navigate everything they need to do without actually owning a bit of it. Right? Now, admittedly, that's not the easiest thing to do, but it can be done. Learn for the lowest common denominator of files. So I'm a writer, or part of what I do is I do a lot of writing. Articles, uh, books, magazines, whatever. I get a lot of writing that I do and I need to manage that, right? So when I do that, I met a writer who used, who used to use, uh, well, yeah, I'm sure you've heard this one. Anybody recently come across someone with a WordPerfect file or a WordStar file? Yeah, you have, right? You have people with their files that are information tied up in formats that they bring it to you and you think, ah, pff, yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna do for you, sorry. I've had the same thing. I had somebody come to me with a Mac version of right now. I uh, couldn't open the file. I had no idea, you know, sorry. And they, it, this is what they told me. But my life's work is on there. My whole dissertation's on there. And I, I, I felt bad for them. But then my reaction was, why'd you, put it in, why'd you do that? Why'd you lock it up in a way we couldn't get to it? Right? Now some people say, well, I use standards, I use Word. Come on, don't make me laugh. Word is, well, first of all, Word's about as far from standard as you can get. But also, there are much more standard things. Anybody here take an adventure guess what the most standard thing is? What's that? You bet. It's a text file. It's been around forever. Anything can open a text file. I can open a text file on a game console. All right? I use text. Now, I do use Markdown. I use Markdown because it allows me to do some simple markup language in the text. I can read it even if it's on there. Uh, anybody here use Markdown at all? So it's a simple markup language, like HTML, but very, much, much simpler. I'll show you a little bit of it, too. It allows me to mark up, mark up things, have them look a certain way, and format them, at least to a certain degree. But I don't have, like HTML, where if you look at an HTML page uh, without being rendered, you can barely read it. There's all the tags and stuff. 
Markdown is very, very small. You could actually read the text file even with the markdown in it. All right? You use things like little slashes and uh, hashtags and things like that to, to choose uh, head, uh, bold, italic, emphasis, that kind of thing. But I always tend to work with the lowest common denominator, be it video, images, or my writing, which is text. Easy to share. Okay? Part of our job is sharing information. So it has to be in some format that I can get it out to people. Send it to people, mail it to people, walk it up to people and hand them a thumb drive. I don't care what it is, but I have to be able to share the information. That also means they have to be able to easily read it, no matter what they got on their side. All right? So I always think about pushing stuff down to its lowest common denominator so I never get this. Oh yeah, I get that, but I couldn't read it, I couldn't play it, I couldn't understand it, it made me go blind, or whatever it is. You don't need that. You need to really, you know, you want to give stuff to people and they go, oh, God, I thank you so much. Finally, understand the limitations of what these things do. Because there are limitations with all these things I'm going to show you. But you've got to work within the limitations. Okay? You've got to understand what they are, and then how do I go about making that work for me? If you do, you can find yourself a lot more free on a day-to-day -day basis when you do, when you do your work. I mean, at, at there, are, there are days when I'm doing a lot of work and I feel like I'm on vacation. Because I'm like, ah, I'm done. literally, go down to the coffee shop and I'll work a little bit down there. I'll walk out, go out, meet with a, okay, I did some work. I had a professor, needed a conference. And their idea of a conference was to go to the tea house and have high tea. Okay, fine, I was working, right? I had my iPad with me because I needed to get some access. They had Wi-Fi in the, in the place. I was answering stuff and they did some other stuff, answered a few questions. And it was great. I got home and I felt like I hadn't worked all day. It was great. And I had done a lot of work. All right? So now, let's get out of this. I'm going to show you some tools. Now, I'm a big proponent of things that are free and or cheap or some combination thereof. Uh, that doesn't mean you're not going to pay for stuff from time to time. You will. But I think a good way to approach this is what can I get? has a low footprint. It uh, doesn't cost me a lot. Because also in technology, all of us should know that in, in this world, Things go away very quickly, all right? So you need to be flexible and say, oh, that tool's gone. I'm going to use this one over here. So I'm going to show you the set that I currently use and why it's important. So let me go over here to Chrome. So I use Chrome. I don't dislike, well, yeah, I do dislike Internet Explorer. But I don't really, I don't hate it. It's just that it doesn't work for me. The reason I use Chrome, and Firefox is actually pretty good as well, is it allows me to log in. I have all my bookmarks and stuff like that, so I have access to my information. Key and portability. I can go wherever, get Chrome, log into it. I got all my stuff available. So right here, I set up a, a folder, which is my tool folder. I'm going to show you some of the stuff I use. Also, within Chrome, when I open it up and log in, it's got a lot of my tools built into it. So the first one is LastPass. You can see it up in the corner. It's the same right here. That allows me to store all my passwords. Okay. Now LastPass is free if you're just using it on a laptop or on a desktop. If you're going to use it with your mobile devices. And then it costs a whopping, I think, $10 a year, $12 a year, something like that. Very flexible. It means wherever I am, I have access to passwords. Now, there are sometimes there are passwords that don't necessarily go to a website. I might need a password to, uh, I have a password to my storage unit. It was in LastPass as well. <laughs> yeah, little bits of information I need to get to, I can put them all inside there. The other thing about, that's nice about LastPass is when you're in your browser and you've logged into your version, it also, will auto, you can have it automatically put the passwords into whatever site, so you don't have to remember what you called it. You don't have to remember anything. You just go to the site, and it'll automatically fill it in. So let me go over to my tools. Well, you say the name of that oh, yeah. It's called LastPass. There are, there are a couple of different ones. I found LastPass is the most flexible for me. You know, it uses uh, military-grade double encryption. They also have... Um, uh, an additional level of security that if you want to get it, you can, which is a little thumb drive. It's a secure thumb drive that you have to decrypt with that. It has to be plugged into whatever computer at. So if you're really, really tight about security and you want to make sure nothing gets to it, it offers that extra step. But the free version um, is on your laptop. You could use a laptop or desktop or whatever, and then 12 bucks gives you access to the mobile version as well. So I'm going to go to my tool folder. Uh, and let's go first thing is Pinboard. So now Pinboard is, who here remembers Delicious? Anybody use Delicious? Yeah. Pinboard is, I call it, this is anti-social bookmarking. Uh, mostly because I'm not, I don't really, really want to share my bookmarks with people. I don't want to find out what Aunt Jane or Nancy down the street are doing for bookmarks. I really don't care. 
To me, it's a little bit more straightforward. I just want to save stuff. Bookmark saved here. Tags on this side. I'm a big proponent of tags. The tags are great. All right. So this is just all my bookmarks. And there's a lot of gunk in here. There's a lot of crap that I don't need. But I just throw it in here. I clean it out occasionally when I'm done with it. So whenever I grab something, a bit of information that I think I might want, um, I was looking at an interview with Jerome Lanier. I tagged him visionary, you know, disruptive technology, some work I was doing. Um, uh, TED Talk was when I was doing my TED Talks. I wanted to review some of this stuff. So I have all these different pieces in here. And then the tags on the side allow me to go around and check stuff. You notice I have a big photography tag there because I'm a photographer. So if I go to that, it'll just bring up all the photography rated stuff. And then it'll also bring up the associated tags. Now, uh, Pinboard is cheap. It's not free, but it is cheap. That's a funny sliding scale. The earlier you got on, the cheaper it was. So when I got on, it was like $6, one payment, lifetime, that's all it is. Now I think it's like $12 or $15, but it's only one payment for the life of, for your life, I guess until you die. Um, so I love this. Love this tool. Easy, fast, great to use. I can get to it from any browser. Right. Next, I'm going to go to SimpleNote. Anybody use SimpleNote? Well, you do. I know you do because I preach to you about it all the time. <laughs> all right, so simple note, you'll notice it right here. This is um, LastPass already filling in. So I set it up today to autofill. You can also set it up that you need to go to LastPass and say autofill it so it doesn't automatically do it. Also, I don't leave this. When I sign out of Chrome here, all of this will be gone. So I'm not going to leave anything behind. But it autofills. So I'm going to go into simple note, sign in. All right. Now, Simple Note is basically a text editor. It's got a little bit of some functionality. Um, I have um, tagging. I got my list of notes here, and then I can write. You'll also notice at the top it's got edit and preview. That's because Simple Note supports um, supports uh, Markdown, so I can do some of my Markdown editing in here, and I can see what it's going to look like. So let me show just a tiny bit of Markdown. So Canvas mobile apps. You can see this is displaying where I get the big headline at the top. If I go up to the edit mode here, all right, just two little hashtags. So the number of hashtags indicates whether, what size heading that's going to be. And if I scroll down, all right, I've got some more. All right, let's say I want to add uh, a Canvas app for Android. I want to make that um, a pull quote. No, yeah, a pull quote. So I'm just going to add a caret here and here. All right, I'm going to go back to preview, scroll down. There, yeah, you can see it does a little pull quote. Oops, I added two. But so that's how Markdown works. And you can read Markdown as text, or you could just read it in the Markdown. And I can export this as Markdown to someplace else. And then my WordPress site uses Markdown. So I can simply go from here, copy and paste, or export it. I don't have to do anything else. So I love Markdown, and I love using text. The other thing is I can export all of these as text. Uh, yeah, you know, in 20 years, I can still open these files. I don't run into a situation where I don't, can't get into the file. So I'm always using the lowest common denominator. Now, some other things about this that I really like, go back to edit mode. There we go. Oh. Um, I come up here, and I can look at my previous version. OK, anybody who's ever had to write stuff, you never get it right the first time. You know, you have a zillion different versions of it. You think about it, you change it. Um, this allows me simply to go through a slider. And I'm like, oh, yep, yep, oh, read the different versions I have, find the one I want, and then I can restore that. Now, I also talked about sharing, too, because I share with my coworkers, all right? So now, let me come over here. One of the things I can do is I can publish it. Now, if I publish it, oh, there we go. What it'll do is it'll publish it, and then it'll give me a URL. I can share that URL with anybody. That, web, that URL will constantly be updated as I change the note. So I can send somebody who's not a Simple Note user, although it's free, I don't know why well, they wouldn't be, but I can send them that. They can simply log into it and watch it update. Right. And then finally, you know, you can come in here. Whoops. Right here, you can pin it to the top. You can do your word count, your character count. And here, it says Markdown formatted. It lets it know that I want to format it with Markdown. 
right? So I'll use Simple Note as sort of a, a place to gather up information, put my ideas together. It's not my final destination, but I'm on the move. It's an easy place to go, and I have a lot of stuff sitting in there. Tools. I also use Workflow. Anybody who use um, lists at all? Any kind of lists? Yeah, I can't think without lists. All right, so here, another free tool, um, and I have it show me stuff as, I, as, I've, as I've checked it off. So I'm talking about, this is my environmental education website. Uh, this is all Western stuff. Uh, it's my book. You know, this is about the, the tech conference that I just organized. So each one of these is its own independent list. And this is also text. You can come in here, click on any one of these, then it'll open it up, show me what I've done and what I haven't done. Okay? I can export these, I can share these, and I really do like the key commands because uh, one area where I think I share with a lot of people who do technology is I'm, I like using the keyboard. It just makes my life a whole lot easier. This is also uh, Simple Note and Workflow are also available as free apps um, on iOS devices and Android devices. So they're also available cross platform, not only cross platform, but cross device. So this allows me to go in and see stuff, and when I tag it, all right, let me back up. The tags here automatically create new sections for these to be in. So I've got like these badges. Um, this is a badge um, presentation that I worked on last year, or a couple of years ago. Um, so by clicking, by making a badges um, tag, a hashtag, all right, so if I come over here and click on badges, you're gonna see everything in the badges area. But the badges hashtag also allows me to go to that section. All right. And again, this shows me what I've done, what I haven't done, live links, everything I can put in here. So this is another repository for information. So I have information. I have it floating around in lots of different places. All right. Then, this is an, is an easy one. Some sort of cloud storage. All right. I'm sure people here have something that they use, whether it be OneDrive, Dropbox, uh, Box, copy, there's a ton of them out there. A lot of them give you free storage. Now this is one of the areas where I actually spend a little money. I actually pay to have a larger Dropbox account because I use it as a repository for lots of different things. All right, literally a Dropbox. Um, I've used it to upload um, videos to. I can live link, I can share a, a folder. All right? um, I got uh, headhunted a few years ago by the people who make Canvas and they wanted some information. I submitted some information for them and I was able to share the folder in Dropbox just to them for a certain period of time. All right. um, I also use it for, not for student work, um, because it's not uh, HIPAA and FERPA compliant, but when I teach and I have people want to share stuff where it's, it's not, it doesn't contain their information, but they want an easy way to do it, or I want to share stuff to them, again, I can also pop it on here if, for, for instance, I have some students who are not on Canvas who are remote users. We have some remote users that are out in the peninsula and they don't have access or something like that or they don't have access to Canvas, and there's a lot of reasons. This is an alternative or a fallback. And also, I use it for personal means, you know? Share something with a relative, you know? Share something with, sometimes I share something with, you know, my wife or my son, just using this tool. But it's a great, it's a great tool. I think I got a terabyte of space on it. It's relatively inexpensive, it's like 10 bucks a month. And lastly, I wanna show you this. It's called Dillinger. Now, Dillinger, again, I'm a, as being a Markdown user, Dillinger is a free Markdown editor online. All right? Allows me to see the work I'm working on here and the preview on this side. I can limp, link it up to my various different accounts. So in this case, I'm going to go out and show you. I can import from, from my Dropbox, from GitHub, from Google Drive, or OneDrive, whichever one I happen to be using. So let me go to Dropbox, for instance, and look. Go to Dropbox. What it'll do... Yeah, yeah. Allow it. There we go. It'll search through my Dropbox account, find all my um, markdown files, and then give me a list and see which one I want. So I can take a look and say, oh yeah, they all know this stuff, that document, socially awkward. Maybe that's the one I want to work on. Come over, click on it, edit it. Then I can save it back. I can save to any one of those same sources. I can copy and paste to my WordPress site. So I have lots of different ways that I can do this. All right? And this, I've actually, I worked on stuff when I was in Spain. And believe me, when you're, this, is, this is really the test. Anybody ever been to Europe, been to Europe recently? 
Okay, so there's this, there's this pervasive lie in Europe that Wi-Fi is everywhere, which is baloney. Because everywhere I'd go, they would have Wi-Fi, but the Wi-Fi routers were turned off. So I was like, oh, we have, well, and it was great. And I speak Spanish, and not like I didn't know what they were saying. So I'd ask them about their Wi-Fi, and I call it Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah, yeah, see, it's getting Wi-Fi. And you go in, and you'd look at the router, and it was off. The lights were off. It was unplugged. And you'd be like, I, I can go fix that. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, the service people are coming to fix it. Like, no, 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 I know how to fix it. No, 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 no. So uh, getting Wi-Fi was not easy, but I was able to do updates, work. I was able to do my markdown stuff from there. Whenever I did manage to get it, an advantage to using lowest common denominator, let me tell you, it's a lot easier to work on a markdown file, text, online, when you've got a, I don't know, a 96K connection. <laughs> it still works. You know, it's not like having to work on video or, you know, my big pictures or something like that. Now, lastly, as a photographer, I also use imagery a lot of what I do, right? You'll even see in my, in my bag, I have my camera with it a lot. So I use, pretty typically, Flickr. Come in, and you're going to see it automatically fill in. This is um, uh, LastPass doing its job. Sign in. So I go to my Flickr account. Oh, that's not my Flickr account. Go to mine. All right. So then I can come in. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's my buddy right there. Oh, there we go. Um, so I can come in. Believe me, he's going to have a snuggle fest when I get home because I left him at the kennel. So when I get home, he's going to just be crazy. But I can come in. I can share my files. I can embed my files. I can download my files. All right. So over here, I have the ability to share and embed. And I moderate some photography forums, too. So I can come in and use BB code and links. And this is all housed, on, um, housed um, online. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have a setup at home where I go, I put my high-res photos. I do, all right? But, all right, I, I shoot a 16 megapixel. I shoot in RAW. I have a 32 gigabyte card. That's like 2,000 images. And I have two or three of those cards. I could do a month somewhere and still not fill them up. So while I'm traveling, I can take those. I can take a little, I have a, little, I have a card reader that's like this big, all right? Plugs into my iPad. I can actually take a few off, upload them, upload them to here if I want. The rest I just keep on some cards. And mind you, the cards, the cards are tiny. Let me show you. This is another example of this. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah, I don't need that. So that is, I think it's 2,500 images. If I decide to shoot JPEG, it's 5,200 images, all right? This is about a third the size of a business card, and that's if it's in the case. If I keep it out of the case, then it's smaller. These are like 10 bucks, 15 bucks. I could travel with like 10 of these. I've seen people travel. I have a friend of mine who travels with a laptop and a hard drive and all this crap, all right? I travel with 10 of these. You know, it cost me what, 150 bucks. Not even actually buy them in bulk, and you know, I could fit it in a cigarette case if I wanted, or you know, a case that holds cards, all right? And I just travel with these. I don't have anything to break. I just don't drop them in the water or something like that. But it's great, all right? Tiny, and because I like to explore. And this happened several years ago. I went to Europe and I was trying to explore, and I had all that stuff with me, and I couldn't go where I wanted. So now I only carry a tiny bag. I could scale up the side of a castle if I want, or get into a hole or get mugged or whatever I need, but I can do it and I can have my experience. So here, I have my images. I've created this system, I haven't created anything. I've put together a system where I can share stuff, I can get access to stuff, right? I have most of the stuff I need up here. And then, yeah, I do have my computer at home and I, I use that as well. And it's not that I don't use it, but I'm not chained to it, right? I can leave it for long periods of time and not suffer any withdrawal. And that's sort of the point of this. Creating a portable workflow is about finding your balance and finding a way to pull yourself away from always being here and being out there. Because that's really where it all is. It's out there. So that's what I got. So questions? <laughs> they told Robert, I was getting a lot of that. Like, uh, I don't know about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do. I used to use Agile Bits. And the reason I switched over to LastPass is I didn't quite like the way Agile Bits worked online. It was good, all right? And it's not, 
it's not a problem with it. And it's also more expensive. All right, so it was one of those, you know, the whole cheap and free thing. I looked at LastPass and I thought, well, it works too, and it's cheaper. Um, I think it's good though. If you like Agile Bits, I know people use it and love it. That's great. You know, it's, uh, it's called, um, what's the app called? Uh, one Password, yeah. Yeah, it's a good, it, I worked with, we used it for years. In fact, I transferred everything over from one password to LastPass. So I still have lots of my password tape from one password. Yeah, it's a terrific tool. And that was at a time when there wasn't any other tool that worked on the devices either. So yeah, it's a good tool. And, I, and here it's gotten a lot better too. No, I just looked up one password anyway. I didn't know that you could, uh, I didn't use it on my device, but it looks like you can use it. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I did not know that. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can use it. And also, <laughs> this is going to sound silly, but from my years as a designer, I thought one password is kind of ugly. <laughs> and I know it's silly, but I, I, I'm that way. You know, it's like, had this funny, like when you open it up, this big door kind of, you, know, you had to click on the button and to turn the key, and I was just like, yeah, whatever. But yeah, it's a good, it's a good piece of software. It works great. Anybody else? Why not Google Docs? You know, I use Google Docs too, but I don't use it as much. Um, partly because the whole sort of Google Docs, Google Spreadsheet, I don't do a lot of those kinds of files. Primarily what I do is writing, and I do Markdown. And Google Docs doesn't really support Markdown very well. Um, as a place to store stuff, it's fine. But then again, I also have issues with Google and their sort of how much information they have, how much I want to put on their servers. So I don't dislike Google, and I, I think they make some, some really nice tools, and I do, I use Gmail, all right? So I don't know why I'm too paranoid about it, because they read all my email anyway. Um, but I just decided with my, especially with my book and stuff like that, my articles, and I wasn't sure I wanted them on their servers. That was really what it came down to. But as a service, I do have, I have an account and I have it hooked up to all my different services that use it. So it's there and I do have some stuff. I do some Google Docs stuff that's work related because I know a lot of faculty and stuff use Google Docs, so I'll put it there and it's easy to share with them. Again, that's one of those situations where you use whatever tool is gonna work. You know, like if I have to share something with you and you go to Google Docs, then it's Google Docs. Yeah, well you get the top talking box. So, tell us about your experiences with SharePoint. <laughs> okay, we recently switched over to Office 365. Um, and uh, let's just say it wasn't the smoothest switch over. Um, I have never been a huge fan of the, way Microsoft, of the way Microsoft tools work. I know a lot of people use them, they just have never been the right fit for me. When we switch over to Office 365, a lot of it's either SharePoint or it, it's all built around the SharePoint engine. I just find it very clunky. Now, I do use it because we have got some situations, I'll show you one right here. This is a work thing. Where I do use, um, now let's log in. Okay, I swear, working on a computer leaning over like this is just about the worst. <laughs> there we go. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, see? This is the one I don't keep in, in LastPass. I don't keep it in LastPass because you change it so often. All right, so if I go into, uh, come on, come on, come on, come on. So I'm going to Office 365. My OneDrive, this is the one thing I do use out of their system, which works fairly well, but it's real specific. So I manage a lot of the accounts on Canvas, and we get a lot of requests for um, people who want non-CRN-based courses and a guest to enter the classes. So what I have is these, um, these shareable online Excel files. This is one of the situations where I do use something like this. So this is shared with all the relevant people that need to have access to it. So it's the requester, the date, the person, their, their login name. Oh, somebody who did it while I was gone and didn't fill it out right. Um, what their email address and what class they went into. So I do use some of these tools in this way at work because we're an Office 365 shop. So in that respect, I use them because that's what I need to use for that. Now my experience with SharePoint is if I, ha if I didn't have to use it, I probably wouldn't use it. I probably wouldn't use any of the Office 365 tools because I just find them a little cumbersome. You know, and I just find that they're, they just, they don't, I, I prize things that work quickly and easily and flexible, and I just don't find that's the case with these. 
they're good for, if, if you're bought into this and that's what you got, well, then fine. I have them because I also have a client, faculty, and staff that use these and I need to communicate with them. So in that respect, I do. And I use Outlook and I use some of the other tools. There you go. Oh, it's back. Uh oh, Jesus. Um, I do, well, I just started, yeah, Amazon S3. And it's funny, I got into that simply uh, through GitHub. I used some of it through GitHub for some code stuff. And then also because that's the servers that Canvas uses, Amazon S3. And I'd, I'd looked into it, I kind of liked, liked what I was seeing. The cost was a little bit more than I wanted to shoulder at the moment. But I like it, it's good, it's reliable, and based on the way Canvas works, using those same servers, it never goes down, there's always contingencies of backups. I like it quite a bit. I just don't have, I'm not at the point now where I, like, I have a need for it, but if I needed to do a lot more code sharing or something like that, or just bigger bulk or more space or something like that, I would, re I would easily use that. I, I like it quite a bit. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's, I, what's that? Oh, what's the subject for my book? Uh, it's a fiction, it's about a, Old man, not old man, this is me. Um, it's about a guy my age, living in my house, and he go, he's looking out at his shed. I have this horrible shed in the back of my house where the door never closes. And when I first moved in, the damn door was always open, and I kept you know, having these ideas like, what the hell's opening the door? Is it a raccoon or something? So the story started as a story I was writing for my son, who's 12, um, about the father looking at the door every day and it's open. And then one day he sees this big white thing crawl in and it's a vampire. So it's, that's what it's about. So this father gets thrown into having to deal with this and he really doesn't want to do it. And he happens to work at Western. So he's just, and he, so all of you are in it actually. All my coworkers are in it in some fashion. So you had a question. Yeah, so the question is, Okay, so your question was, Flickr, uh, you notice Flickr has, thousand, has a terabyte of storage. And that's its, that's its free account. Um, and what resolution do you store? I can store up to my full resolution files, and I do. Um, I don't archive all my stuff there, because um, I, I have it split up in different areas. It's contingency. So I have a lot of it there. That's the stuff that I work on and I want to show. I do actually archive my own stuff on an actual drive, physical drive sitting in my house. And I also have some on... Um, I have some on Dropbox too, I have different collections that I'll put up. But yeah, they have, they'll store the full res images. I also use 500 pix, or 500 px, 500 pix. Um, very similar to Flickr, similar kind of community, but it's a different group of photographers. And that is geared more toward people who want to sell their stuff too. Um, and you can do it on Flickr, but it's, it's built into 500 pix. So I have different collections in both spots. But yeah, you can store your high res images up there. And I've, I've shot stuff for clients and put it up there for them to review, and then I take it down when I'm done, so. I've noticed they have an app that features apps in mobile, Yeah. Yeah, and the app is pretty good. I still use the website a lot, even on my, on my devices. The app is good, too. It was, it was one of those things I just got used to using it on the, on the browser and the, on the iPad, so, and that works just as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I, I hear you. But what I like about Flickr is I like the way you can photo share. It's really easy to photo share out, and you can create collections. Uh, Apple's photo share is nice, but it also ties into their ecosystem. And I don't necessarily, even though I'm an Apple user, I don't necessarily want to be tied into their ecosystem. Go back and forth. Yeah, exactly. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much.